We do have quite a bit of content to cover today. I'll just reiterate what Emily was saying. Um, if you do have a question um, or a comment, please feel free to submit it as we're going through the information. Um, and some of them we may address as we're walking along. Um, if we do get through all the information timely, we may be able to answer a few questions that you submit um, while, we're, while we're on this webinar today. Otherwise, you can expect to receive a response from us on an answer um, within the next week or so. So we'll go ahead and dive right in. Um, as since our last webinar, there have been quite a few changes. Um, not surprising since I believe I had read a statistic last night that since um, the PPP, in the first 10 weeks that the, um, of the PPP being released, the SBA had issued 18 sets of rule changes and 17 updates to the frequently asked questions just in the first 10 weeks of the program. So, I think you all know, along with us, that things have been changing on an almost daily basis. Sometimes it feels like a minute-to-minute -minute basis, um, but it's really true. Um, with those statistics, again, that was just in the first 10 weeks. Forget about what's come after that. Um, so things continue to change. Um, we'll go through a, a couple of those changes, a couple of those um, items that are still likely to to continue to change, um, and we'll talk about the things that impact you right now. Everybody is pretty much centered around forgiveness, so that's really what we're gonna talk a lot about in this webinar today. Um, so just a reminder, uh, just just a, a disclaimer, we do this each time. Um, you know, we, we aren't providing legal advice. Um, as I said, information continues to change um, on an almost minute by minute basis sometimes. Um, and so we are offering our general ideas and considerations. Um, each organization situation is vastly different from the next. Um, Melody and I can tell you from the probably thousands of questions we've answered at this point, there are almost no two situations that are exactly alike. Um, so just know that if you have a question about your organization, um, we may have a pretty good answer, but uh, the likelihood is, is it's pretty unique to your situation. So we're going to do our best to, um, to give you the advice that we have based on the information that's available. So I wanted to first start off with an update on some PPP news and statistics. Um, June 30th was kind of a big day. Um, that was yesterday. It's hard to believe it's already July 1st, um, but June 30th was a big day when it came to the original PPP loan process and information. Um, as of last night, um, as I was wrapping up these slides last night, I did one last search on PPP news and updates, um, only to find that at the 11th hour, as per usual, um, the Senate had actually passed um, a bill extending the application to apply to August 8th. So originally, the last day to apply for a PPP loan was actually yesterday. So as of 5 p.m. yesterday, um, there was no way, there was nothing in sight that said that you would be able to apply for a PPP loan after yesterday. As of this morning, it passed through the Senate. It must still pass the House and be signed by the President, but it's more than likely that this is going to happen. Um, I think there was some information that they're hoping to get this through before the recess, either this week or next week. So you may not actually be able to apply for a loan today, um, but just be aware that if you didn't apply for a loan originally, if you were still thinking about it, or you know of other organizations or businesses, um, that didn't apply for a loan before June 30th, there is a very, very, very more than likely chance that um, you're going to have until August 8th to apply for the remaining funds that are available. Um, that kind of leads into the next stat that as of yesterday, almost $130 billion of the allocated funds for the PPP loan program remains unspent. Um, obviously, this has a lot to do with the extension of the application, uh, being able to apply for the loan. Um, there was, a, you know, a, a big rush for the funds in the first 310 or 340 billion dollars that was allocated in the first round. Things kind of slowed down with the second batch of funds. People got a little bit nervous about um, applying for the loans. There was some scrutiny over some of the certifications. Um, also, the loans primarily went to smaller businesses that needed it in that second round. So I think there are probably organizations that weren't sure if they could use the money in the eight-week period. Now it's a 24-week period. Um, so you've got a little bit more leeway in being able to use it. 
Um, so again, as of yesterday, over 4.8 million loans had been approved um, and the average loan size at this point is about $107,000. So that's down substantially from the first batch of funds. That first 300 plus billion dollars that was allocated to this program, the average loan size was actually over $200,000. So now we're down to you know, a, a reasonable amount. We can see that uh, you know, smaller businesses are applying for these loans and getting it. Did want to make sure that everybody is aware. Um, we've talked about this on a number of other webinars, something to be thinking about. Um, because this is taxpayer funded money, um, there was a lot of push to have the loan recipients information released. So as of, I believe last week, um, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, did confirm that we should expect to see information released on any borrowers who received a loan in excess of $150,000, um, potentially by tomorrow. Uh, so just be aware that this information is likely to come out sooner rather than later. Um, the information that will be included in that release uh, will include the name of your business, um, the address, demographic data, and the number of jobs supported by the business. Um, so that's what you can expect to see. In addition, the exact loan amount will not be disclosed, um, but they will disclose the range. So there are five ranges that you'll see. There's between $150,000 and $350,000. $350,000 to a million, one million to two million, two million to five million, and five million to 10 million. So again, the exact loan amount that you received will not be disclosed in the information release, but you will uh, have the, the range, um, whatever range you fall into, that will be included with your demographic information. So just make sure that you're aware of that. Um, I do know that we talked to a lot of people about the potential for that. We always wanted to make sure that, that was, there, there was potential that that was gonna happen. So if there were any concerns around that, it was important to think about that before you applied for the loan. Um, but this is the information that's happening. So the uh, loans over 150,000 actually account for about 75% of the loans um, requested and approved through the amount of money that's been allocated so far. However, as you can see with that average loan size, there is a very large amount of borrowers that are actually still going to fall under that $150,000. So while it seems like that $150,000 is a small amount compared to the um, max amount of 10 million, um, there are actually going to be fewer names listed in the information release than actually received the loans because that average loan size has gone down so significantly. More people have received loans less than $150,000, even though 75% of the spent funds are over $150,000. So expect to see that. Um, I, I had read yesterday that it potentially will be coming out tomorrow. So that gives you kind of an update as to where we're at basically as of this morning. Um, so again, as you can see, information is coming out um, rapidly and regularly. So we're doing our best to keep things up to date um, and making sure that you're aware of what's going on. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into some of the changes that we've seen since our last webinar. So our last webinar we had focused on the application that was released. And at the time there was only one application. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, in addition, a huge change occurred with the PPP program. And that came through the PPP Flexibility Act, which was signed by the president on June 5th. So here in this chart, we have a couple of comparisons that were showing kind of the key things that changed. Um, the PPP Flexibility Act is a fairly short bill, actually. It's really not quite as wordy as many of these bills um, have been. So it's a little bit easier to understand than some of the others, but it actually changed a whole heck of a lot of stuff. Um, so to just kind of walk through before and after, um, the first area is when can you use the loan proceeds to? So before the act, June 30th um, was kind of a, a date that was put out there. Um, although there were implications that you could go further considering that the date to apply was June 30th. Um, now with the act, you can use it through the end of the year. So based on the former final due, uh, deadline for using the for applying for the funds being June 30th, and now if that's extended, it's possible that you may be able to use the funds 
beyond December 31st if you use the 20, using the 24 week period. But the likelihood it is um, the way that the loan is calculated is still two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So the amount of money that you apply for, um, if you are able to apply uh, today and beyond, is not going to change. That calculation will still stand at two and a half times your average monthly payroll. So the idea of being able to actually use it for a full 24 weeks is unlikely because you're still only getting that two and a half times your average monthly payroll. Um, so the likelihood is, is that you should be able to use it well before December 31st. A big, a big piece of the, of the new um, act was the forgiveness or the covered period. So originally we spent a lot of time talking about the eight week covered period. There was a lot of uproar about that eight weeks not being enough. Um, and certainly nobody had any idea what was going to happen with this pandemic. Um, but uh, as time went on, we saw that obviously businesses weren't able to open and up, open up. Um, they weren't able to rehire staff. Um, for example, you know, restaurants and bars. Um, we're here in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, we just got noticed today that our phased approach is moving backwards a little bit because we're seeing a rise in cases. So it's July 1st, and we're moving backwards instead of forwards. So the idea that people could use these funds and keep people on board only for eight weeks was somewhat unreasonable. And so they recognized that and changed that eight week period to a 24 week period. If you received the loan before June 5th, you can opt into that eight week period. You may do that um, because you had used all the funds successfully, maybe for payroll. Maybe you didn't see that large of an interruption in your business and you were able to keep all of your employees on without reducing any wages. Um, and you and you used all the money, so you're ready to apply for forgiveness. Um, those are some of the reasons that you may opt into that eight week period. Um, the 24 weeks is obviously available so that you can use the funds for longer. Some of the caveats still apply where you cannot um, you cannot use the funds to pay an employee more than $100,000 on an annualized basis. So that didn't change. So there are still some caps in place, um, but you just have longer to use it now. The deadline to submit uh, the forgiveness application to the lender. Prior to the PPP Flexibility Act, there was uh, essentially no information about applying for forgiveness besides the, um, the loan forgiveness application form that we had kind of hastily received before the Flexibility Act was signed. With the Flexibility Act, now it is up to 10 months. You must, you must apply within 10 months from the end of your covered period or December 31st, whichever one is, whichever one is earlier. Um, so that means that there is a potential, and, and, and again, we, I think we've talked a little bit about there, or I have talked about this with a number of people, um, there is potential that you may not have to start making payments if any of the portion, if any of the loan is not forgivable, you may not have to start making payments for um, maybe until 2022 if it does turn into a loan. So again, something to be thinking about when you're planning, um, but at this point we do know for sure that you have uh, you have to apply for forgiveness within 10 months from the end of your covered period or December 31st, whichever is earlier. If you don't apply within that 10 month period, you will not have any of the loan forgiven. So just keep that in mind. Um, obviously, this is kind of on the top of people's mind. I don't expect people to forget to apply for forgiveness, um, but it is important to remember that you must apply within that 10 month period. Otherwise, you have no opportunity for any of the loan to be forgivable. The entire, the entire loan will be a loan and you have to pay it back. The spending ratio was another big change. Um, prior to the Flexibility Act, you had to spend at least 75% of the loan received on payroll to be eligible for 100% of loan forgiveness. With the Flexibility Act, they changed that to 60%, so you now have to spend at least 60% on payroll to be eligible for full forgiveness of the loan. This doesn't mean that you have to spend 60% to have any of the loan forgiven. It just means that if you spend less than 60% on eligible payroll costs, you will not have the full loan forgiven. You'll have a portion of the loan forgiven, but not the full loan. So the 60% is not, I've heard it referred to as a cliff. It's not a cliff. You don't have to meet that 60% to be, um, 
to have any possibility of some forgiveness, the forgiveness would be prorated based on whether or not you met that first threshold. So that changed from 75-25 to now 60-40. Um, avoiding penalties. So avoiding penalties, we also refer to that as a safe harbor, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, prior to the Flexibility Act, again, that June 30th date was a big date yesterday. Hard to believe that, that that's already passed. Um, but you had until June 30th to rehire your employees and restore salaries back to their pre-pandemic le levels to avoid a reduction in forgiveness based on a reduction um, in salaries or a reduction in FTEs. That safe harbor date has now been extended to December 31st. So again, that gives you more time to plan, more time to see what's going to happen. Um, but there are some, I, I know we got a lot of questions about when to apply for forgiveness, when can you, when can't you, um, you know, are, are there any changes? So we'll address some of those. But just know that that safe harbor deadline um, to rehire and restore salaries has moved from June 30th to December 31st. In addition, um, the loan term change. Now I wanna make sure that we're really clear about the change in the loan term. So if you received your loan after June 5th, which was when the Flexibility Act was signed into place, you automatically have a five-year loan term if any of your loan is not forgiven, automatically. You don't have to opt into it. You automatically um, are, are in a five-year loan term period. If you received your PPP loan before June 5th, you are still automatically in a two-year loan repayment term. You must, if you want it to be five years, you must talk with your lender and negotiate with them. So it is not an automatic switch. So this, so this five year does not retro back to March 27th when the CARES Act was signed into law. This is for June 5th and later. However, you do have the opportunity to talk to your lender and if your lender is willing to change the terms, they can change it to up to five years but you always wanna make sure that you're referencing your loan document and you're talking with your lender. The last item, um, which I don't like to talk about too much just because I'm, I'm always hesitant to recommend messing with payroll taxes at all. However, if you've been involved, if you've been asking questions, talking to your accountant, you may be familiar with a portion of the CARES Act that allowed businesses and organizations to defer paying their, their um, their FICA Medicare payroll taxes. Again, this is not something that I recommend that you seek out as an option. Um, make sure that you talk to your payroll provider or your accountant before you decide to do something like this. Um, but it, it was an option that was signed into the CARES Act. We're not gonna talk much about that um, option today uh, as we're focusing on the PPP. But prior to the Flexibility Act, you could not take advantage of that payroll tax deferral if you had um, if you had received the, um, the PPP loan, now with the new act, you can um, utilize that payroll tax deferral uh, program that was signed in by the CARES Act, even when you've received the PPP loan. So again, not something that I recommend. Um, that would be kind of a last, last ditch effort if, if you really needed some additional assistance. But please just make sure that you talk with either your payroll provider or your accountant before you make any decision about that. So those were the highlights from the PPP Flexibility Act. Um, a lot of changes, a lot of things to think, think about. Um, they basically had to change the, um, the, the loan forgiveness application forms to align with the new 24 week period or if you wanted to opt into the eight week period. Um, so a lot of things to be thinking about, but I think a lot of ways for people to be able to utilize the funds better, use them all, use them for what they need to use them on, um, and have the, the highest potential for forgiveness. So I think only really good things came out of this Flexibility Act. So moving on, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the applications. Um, if you attended our last webinar, we did kind of walk through the standard application. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time going through the details of the application itself. Um, I would recommend if you weren't able to attend our last uh, webinars, all of that information is still relevant as the calculations uh, for FTEs and reduction of wages hasn't really changed at all. Um, so those webinars would be a good resource for you. 
Um, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that at this point, we now actually have two applications that you can choose from. The standard form is still pretty much the same as it was originally. Um, the standard form includes a Schedule A and a Schedule A worksheet where you need to calculate your full-time equivalents and your annual salary or hourly wage reductions. So just a reminder that calculating FTEs, there are two ways to do that. You can actually calculate the number of hours that your employees worked, divide by 40 to get your actual FTEs, or you can use the simplified method where anybody that works 40 hours or more is equivalent to one FTE, and anybody that works less than 40 hours is equivalent to 0.5 FTE. So again, something to talk with your accountant. Um, if you have an in-house person, something to actually sit and analyze, think about, is that something that you need to do to go with the, comp we'll call it the complex method versus the simple method. In addition, you need to also calculate if you did any annual sal salary or hourly wage reductions. All of that is part of the Schedule A and the Schedule A worksheet. So there is a substantial amount of information depending on the number of employees that you have, the number of changes that you made. There is quite a bit of work involved in that standard form. However, that is the form that you will need to complete and submit if you don't fall in, if you don't meet any of the exceptions in the new EZ form. So again, if you have been keeping up, the new EZ form was actually made available, I believe it was June 15th or 16th. So it's been out for about two weeks now. There haven't been any changes to it at this point since it originally came out. Well, I think it came out on the 15th and then lo and behold, I think there were new instructions on the 16th. So I should bite my tongue in saying that there weren't any changes. Um, but it has been out for two weeks now without any changes, which is surprising. Um, but the new easy form is available um, if you fit into one of the three following categories. So the first one is if you are self-employed, if you're an independent contractor, or you're a sole proprietor and you have no employees. If you fall into that category, you automatically can file the EZ form. The reason for that is if you have no employees, there's nothing to fill out in the Schedule A and the Schedule A worksheet. Because the Schedule A and the worksheet all have to do with calculating the FTEs and the wage reductions. So first, the first box you can check is, is in that category. The second exception you, you may fall into is if you had no annual salary or hourly wage reductions by more than 25% and you had no reductions in your full-time equivalents. So that's, that's the example where maybe your business didn't see a large reduction in, um, in operations. You continued operating as normal. Perhaps you were an essential business maybe you had to add more people to your staff. If you fall into that category, you can automatically apply using the easy form. You just check that box. The third exception that you can fall into, which is going to be, I think, a huge catch-all for a lot of businesses and organizations. Um, the, first, the, the first step you have, to, you have to pass is that you had no annual salary or hourly wage reductions by more than 25%. And you were unable to operate during the covered period at the same level of business activity as before the pandemic due to um, federal, <coughs> state, or local health restrictions that are in place. So the CDC, um, any of the federal agencies, any of our um, government agencies that are um, stating that you can only open up your restaurant at a reduced capacity or you can only provide takeout service and not dine-in service. If there are any of those restrictions in place, and you can essentially prove that you were unable to operate at the same capacity as you were before the pandemic, and you worked to not reduce any hourly, um, hourly wages or annual salaries, you can fill out the EZ form, which means you don't have to work through the calculations. Now, I do want to stress that if you are using the EZ form, in particular for the second two options there, you do have to be prepared to substantiate that you were able to fill out the easy form based on those parameters. So again, you know, I think my favorite word in all of these webinars has been documentation, documentation, documentation. I will never stray from that. We're accountants. <laughs> Kate, can I um, jump in real quick um, just for a second here? Related to this easy form, 
Um, do the safe harbors apply to the reduction in FTEs? So if the only people that are no longer there did voluntary resignation, am I still eligible for this form? You are still eligible. So um, there were a few exceptions that were laid out um, that allowed for you to not calculate a reduction in FTEs. Some of those included, um, like Melody noted, a voluntary resignation. Somebody quit on their own or resigned on their own. If you had reasonable cause to fire an employee, um, that will not impact your FTEs. If you worked to rehire somebody or you worked to restore their hours back to, let's say, from part-time to full-time, and they declined that offer, that will not impact your FTE. But again, I go back to document, document, document. So in reality, you really need to have written documentation that supports that you made these offers or that these resignations or firings happen. So hopefully um, you're working with either an internal HR specialist or outsourcing HR if you're using a PEO for your payroll, hopefully you're working with them in an HR capacity as well. You just need to make sure that you have documentation for everything that you do. I think in these times, um, you know, if you've got these loans, if you're working with these different programs, you literally cannot over document things. Um, the more the better. So there are some, there are some exceptions when you're calculating or thinking about the FTE reductions. So make sure that you're, you're familiar with those and you're comfortable with those. But again, if there were things that kind of happened outside of your um, as an employer outside of your control, having to fire somebody, maybe somebody retired, those, those things will not impact. Just make sure that you have written documentation for them. So this is just an example. Um, just wanted everybody to be able to see, you know, when you're looking at the applications, if you're picking one of them, there's not a whole lot of difference if you're looking at the first page, to be honest. The biggest difference is that the standard form, again, includes that Schedule A and the Schedule A worksheet. So you're gonna have a few more forms associated with the original loan forgiveness application. In addition, that Schedule A worksheet, while it is something that you're gonna to need to fill out and we'll, have, um, we'll need to reference, that Schedule A worksheet is actually not a document that you have to submit to your lender. That's substantiation for your calculations and you need to hold on to that, but it isn't a document that actually needs to be submitted with the application. The easy form, you can see it actually says easy here in the header. Um, so it requires specific documentation, like I mentioned, if you're utilizing the exception related to operations, um, as well as the, the FTEs. Um, but you do just need to make sure that you're thinking about what documentation do I have that substantiates any claims that I'm making? So it's always good to be thinking more is better. So I know that a lot of the questions that were submitted beforehand, um, I saw a lot of questions related to when can I apply? Do I have to wait for the eight week period? Do I have to wait for the 24 week period? So we actually did get quite a few answers on when you can apply for forgiveness. <clears throat> so I wanted to make sure that you had some information related to the different options that you have. So you can actually apply for forgiveness as soon as you have used all of the funds. So you don't have to wait until the end of the 24 week period to apply for forgiveness. You can apply for forgiveness as soon as, as, soon as you have utilized all of the funds. Um, why might you do that? Well, if you want to get that forgiveness application in, figure it out sooner rather than later, you can go ahead and do it right away. If you had no reductions in wages that were greater than 25% during the covered period, you might want to go ahead and get that application in right away. If all of your loan proceeds were used for eligible expenses with at least 60% use for payroll costs and, you, and you're expecting that 100% of the loan is gonna be forgiven, you might be more inclined to go ahead and apply for forgiveness right away. <clears throat> but I do wanna make sure that everybody is aware of, we talked a little bit before with the Flexibility Act about those safe harbor dates. So if you do decide to apply for forgiveness right away when you've, lose, when you've used all the funds, 
if you were in a situation where you had to reduce annual salary or hourly wages for your employees by more than 25%, you will automatically lose that December 31st safe harbor date to rehire or reinstate wages for your employees. So essentially that safe harbor date goes away. The safe harbor date was put in place to allow you time to rehire or reinstate wages so that your amount of forgiveness, if you were able to rehire or restore wages by that safe harbor date, your forgiveness would go back up to whatever the maximum amount it could be. So if you decide to apply right away, but you did have to reduce wages, you lose that December 31st safe harbor date. And what actually ends up happening is they will take that reduction in wages and multiply it by your covered period. So let's say you had somebody that was making $1,000 a week, and during your covered period, you were paying them $700 a week, but they were still working the same amount of hours. So they were a full-time employee working 40 hours a week, you were paying them $1,000. During the covered period, with the PPP funds, you only paid them $700. So you have now put them below that 25, you've reduced their wages by more than 25%, you've reduced their wages by 30%. So by, by applying early and losing that safe harbor, you're going to have to take that extra, that $50 that is between seven, $750 would have been your 25% reduction and you would have been fine then. But because you reduced their wages by 30%, that 5% that is above and beyond the 25% is actually going to be calculated as a reduction in your loan forgiveness over the full 24 week period, even though you didn't use the funds over the full 24 week period. So you're gonna take that $50, which is the difference between a 25% reduction and a 30% reduction and multiply it by 24 weeks. And that's gonna be the reduction in your loan forgiveness amount. So you just wanna be careful, again, a conversation that you're gonna to wanna to have with your lender, with your accountant, before jumping in to the loan application, uh, the loan forgiveness application process, because there are some things that you definitely wanna be thinking about. You wanna make sure that you're thinking about maximum forgiveness if possible, and there is potential that things could shift and change and maybe get better by December 31st. Um, obviously, it's a lot to think about. We have no idea what's going to happen for the next six months of the year, but it gives you a little bit more time to figure out how you can possibly achieve maximum forgiveness if you did have to reduce wages by more than 25% over the period that you use the funds. If you choose to wait to the end of your covered period, which again is eight weeks if you opt into that, or it's automatically 24 weeks if you um, received your loan June 5th or later or if you received it before, you can opt into the 24 weeks. The December 31st safe harbor deadline remains intact. So that means you have until December 31st, even if you used all of your PPP loan money by September 1st, you still have until December 31st to rehire or reinstate wages by December 31st to uh, be eligible for maximum forgiveness. In addition, it gives you just some more time to utilize the funds. And if you are thinking that there's going to be a portion that is not forgiven, um, waiting until the end of your covered period actually delays the first potential loan payment. Um, because again, you, you have 10 months from the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. So you can actually push that first payment out quite a bit. Um, there, there are a number of different dates uh, that align with when you would have to actually start making your first payment, um, just to give you a, kind of a, a basic set of rules for the timing. Um, if you, so you have to apply within 10 months um, after the last day of the 24 week period, if you choose to wait until the end of your, 20, end of your covered period, the lender then has 60 days to approve your loan forgiveness application. They then submit that to the SBA and the SBA has 90 days to agree with that determination that your lender made. And then the SBA, <coughs> excuse me, must uh, reimburse the bank for that money. So you don't have to actually start making payments to the bank for this loan until 12 months 
after the bank receives the forgivable portion of the loan from the SBA. So there's a lot of things going on there. But essentially, you may not have to be making payments until probably into 2022 if you delay putting the application in. So a number of different things to think about. Again, we, we talk about how every organization, every business is different. Each one has a unique situation. Um, please make sure that you're talking with either your in-house accountant, CFO, finance director, or if you have an outside accountant, um, talk to them, analyze, make sure that the decision that you make makes the most sense for your organization. Another question that I saw quite a bit was what documents do I need? So I will um, reiterate that the loan application itself, there are, there's a separate set of instructions. There's the application and then there's instructions for the application. The instructions for the application does, I think, a pretty good job of listing out all of the documents that you will actually need to submit with your application and what you must maintain, but you don't actually have to submit. So some of the key things, again, more documentation is always better than less, but some of the key things that you will need to submit with your application um, regarding the payroll expenses are things like payroll reports, um, payroll tax filings that align with, not align with, but that, um, that cross over your covered period. Um, think your, nine for, your quarterly 941s, which is your FICA Medicare filing, and your quarterly state unemployment forms. Those would be two likely uh, documents that they'll need. Any receipts, canceled checks, or account statements for the employer paid health insurance and retirement contributions, those are eligible costs. Um, document to support the FTE calculations. Again, that's only if you're doing the standard form. Um, if you're doing the easy form, um, you don't really need the documentation to support the FTE calculations. Um, you do need documentation to support that you didn't have a change in FTEs, but you don't actually have to do the calculations themselves. If you're using this to pay for any mortgage interest, um, having the amortization schedule, either from the lender or the bank, um, or something that you or your accountant put together, um, would be uh, something that you'll need to have. Uh, receipts and canceled checks for eligible services. So think utilities, um, you know, your electricity, your gas, you'll want to have documentation that you paid for those. If you're using it for rent, um, a copy of your current lease agreement, and any copies of invoices, again, for utilities to ensure that these were valid expenses. As a reminder, you can only use um, the PPP funds for the non-payroll costs that were in effect as of February 15th. So if you had a lease agreement, a new lease agreement that didn't start until March 1st, that is actually not an eligible cost that you can use for, that you can use the PPP funds for. Gas, electric, telephone services, all needed to be in place prior to February 15th for them to be eligible costs. For the documents that you have to maintain, but you do not have to actually submit with the application, um, as I mentioned before, the Schedule A worksheet and that documentation supporting amounts, the written documentation regarding employee job offers and refusals, so that was um, the question that Melody posed earlier. You don't actually have to submit that with the application, but you want to make sure that you have that documentation on file if somebody comes asking for it. The documentation supporting the certification that the business was not able to operate at the same level due to compliance with the health standards form. So again, make sure that you have that information available if it's requested. And then any records that support the borrower's necessity of the loan request, eligibility for the loan, and request for forgiveness. So those last few items have a lot to do with the certifications that you actually have to make on the form itself. So similar to the, um, the actual application for the loan, on the application for forgiveness, you do need to make certifications that stated that you used the loan for the appropriate purposes, that you've gone through and, and the calculations to the best of your knowledge are correct, that you've provided the appropriate supporting documentation. You need to once again make those certifications that you used the loan as it was intended to be used. So you just wanna make sure that you have substantiation for any of those certifications. It does note in the application instructions um, that they, the SBA, the federal government, the banks, et cetera, um, make sure that you keep all of these documents for at least six years, um, if not longer. We, we talked a little bit about 
you know, who is open to an audit. Um, the, the Treasury had stated that anybody that received a loan of more than $2 million was um, pretty much guaranteed to be audited by the SBA and or the, and or the federal government. Um, there is still a likelihood that even if you received a loan of $50,000, maybe $10,000, that does not eliminate the possibility that you may be audited. Anybody that received a loan has the potential to be audited. It's just guaranteed that if you received more than $2 million, that you will be. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you have all of this documentation kept and available and complete so that if something were to come to you later, two years, three years, four years down the road, um, and somebody was requesting this information from you, that you have it all and it's complete and it ties to the application and the schedules that you've created. So since, um, since this is our for-profit section, I wanted to make sure that we were talking um, about some specific topics that relate to our business owners um, and our for-profit clients and other folks out there in the, in the country. It looked like we had quite a few people from different states uh, joining us today. So there are a number of things that you need to think about depending on the entity uh, structure that you have. So one of the things that came up pretty frequently was this owner employee and self-employed payroll, um, payroll costs. So I wanted to make sure that everybody was clear that there were caps on the amount that you could pay owner, employee, and self-employed. So if you opt into the eight week period, you are still capped at eight of 52 weeks worth of 2019 compensation. And that $15,385 is based on an annual salary of $100,000. So again, we can't use the PPP funds to pay anyone more than $100,000 on an annualized basis. That 15385 is the max. Again, they're going to be looking at um, the, the compensation received in 2019, and you can pay yourself as an owner-employee or a self-employed individual eight of 52 weeks worth of your 2019 compensation. If you are using the 24-week period op covered period option, you can pay yourself two and a half of 12 months worth of your 2019 compensation capped at $20,833. So that has to do with the fact that obviously extending the time to use the funds um, gives, you, gives you the ability to potentially, if you are um, a self-employed, you're the only person you have no employees, and you would have received a loan in the amount of two and a half times your 29th, average 2019 compensation, you're actually able to use all of the money you received from the loan to pay yourself. It, that's essentially what this two and a half of 12 months uh, for the 20 week period option, 24 week period option is doing. One important item to note um, that the, the more recent interim final rulings clarified, these capped amounts are in total across all of your businesses. So if you are an owner of multiple businesses, that $15,000 or $20,000 cap is in total across all businesses. You don't get to take that amount of money from each individual business. You can take that amount in total, either from multiple businesses or take it all from one of your businesses, but that's not, it's not $20,000 for entity A, B, and C if you're an owner in each. It's capped across all of your businesses. So that's an important thing to, thing to remember. Hey, while you're on that slide, um, we have a couple of people on that are part of worker co-ops. Can you clarify the owner relationship with worker co-ops and what the rules are there? Sure, so I'm actually gonna go to the next slide and talk about that a little bit more. I know that I have um, talked to a number of worker co-ops over the last few months. Um, and of course, co-ops have not really been specifically addressed in any of the guidance that we've received. Um, it's a little bit similar to the way that a lot of the nonprofit guidance really hasn't come out uh, to, in, you know, to talk, when we talk about ownership, obviously nonprofits don't have ownership and cooperatives similarly have a very different type of ownership structure. Um, than most of our, you know, our standard uh, entity specific organizations. So I will specify that there is no guidance that is specific to co-ops. 
However, this owner employee term um, would fall into uh, a lot of the, the worker co-ops and, and other co-ops in general where people are employees and also owners. Um, the rule is if you're a more than 20% owner, um, that's where some of these caps are falling in. Um, but if you are in that situation, you're looking at those caps and that's the, that's the most you file matches up with what you applied for on the, at the onset of your, um, your PPP loan application itself. Um, that was supposed to be the backup documentation that you use to actually apply for the loan when calculating that owner compensation replacement. So you'll just want to make sure that there weren't any drastic changes. Um, yeah, let me point. just, I think I've got this one last okay. slide and then let's, um, so this, uh, I wanted to make sure that, again, since this is our, this is our for-profit session, um, that we talked just a little bit about the tax implications. Um, obviously, these things are going to continue to change. Um, for right now, as it stands, the forgiven portion of the loan is tax exempt income. So if you received a loan of $100,000, $75,000 of it was forgiven. That $75,000 is tax exempt income to you. The $25,000 is obviously on your books as a loan. As it stands right now, there's a current IRS rule <coughs> that states that no deduction is allowed for an expense that's otherwise deductible if the payment of the expense results in forgiveness of a PPP loan. So in simplified terms, any expense that was covered by the forgivable portion of the PPP loan will not be tax deductible. So that's important to think about um, because what they're saying right now is that that's double dipping. So you would receive tax exempt income, but you'd also get a deduction, which they're saying is double dipping. Um, there's a lot of bipartisan support to get rid of that IRS rule. And obviously there's a lot of time before the end of this calendar year I would say that I would expect this to change mostly due to the fact that there's going to be so much crossing over of years in terms of when you apply for forgiveness, when you actually get granted forgiveness, um, when you actually have the expenses. So many people are going to have the expenses in 2020, or not many people, everyone is, is going to have the expenses in 2020, but you may not actually get a forgiveness amount until 2021. So what do we do then? Um, then we've got expenses that you can't, that, that you do take, but then it, it's, it's a pretty big mess at this point. But I wanted to make sure that everybody understood what the rules are right now. Um, but I do expect that there will be some changes here. Melody, that's all I have. So if there are some questions, it looks like we've got about five, five, seven minutes or so. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of specific questions like we said we'll address afterwards, but there's a few general ones here that um, more people may be interested in. Sure. Can you apply for more than one PPP loan since they've come up with additional, you know, extended periods or once you've applied, you're done? So at this point, once you've applied, you're done. I have seen quite a bit in the news about uh, the potential that they would open up the remaining funds or potentially another round of funding that would be specific to either certain sized businesses or certain types of businesses where you may actually be able to apply for a second loan. But that right now is just um, something that's in the works. So as it stands right now, if you already applied for a loan, you are not able to apply for another PPP loan. There are other SBA, um, uh, loan programs that you can apply for. Um, so if you are still looking for something, I recommend looking into the other SBA programs that are out there. Um, there's still EIDL money available. Um, and there's uh, the standard SBA 7A loan program. If you actually fit into the SBA's standard definition of a small business, there are other options out there. But as it stands right now, no, you cannot apply for another PPP loan. Great, thank you. Um, do you have any indication where that information you talked about at the beginning on borrowers is going to be reflected? Is it going to be on the SBA website? 
and any indication of where that will be shown? Which information are you referring to? The borrower information on who borrowed and how much. Ah. Um, I do not know where. I, I assume it's going to be on the sba.gov website. Um, I expect it also, uh, if, you, if you search the news, you'll see that the information is going to be released. So the likelihood is, is that you'll be able to find it if you just do a search once they release the names. But I believe it will be for sure on the sba.gov website. And then I, we, I know you talked about the wage reduction if you decide to apply before December 31st, but FTEs, is the safe harbor deadline for FTEs the forgiveness date that you apply or is that still December 31st? So it is, um, it is not December, if you apply early, that December 31st safe harbor date goes away completely to rehire or to reinstate wages. So that safe harbor date is essentially null and void if you decide to apply before the end of the 24 week period. Great. Um, on the easy form, it says employees at time of application. Is that FTEs or total headcount? So if you're referring to at the top of the, um, the loan application, I believe that that is headcount um, because it's right next to a question that's asking for employees at the time of your application, which I believe is similar to the question that was on the actual loan application itself that was at the top and it said, maybe it said number of jobs um, or number of employees, but that was referring to headcount, not FTE. Um, if you are um, calculating FTEs, I, I think there, there may be, you're talking about the easy form. I believe that it's number of employees because the, the expectation is that if you're filing the easy form and you're choosing the option that um, you didn't reduce your FTEs, that you have backup, that you don't have to submit with your application, but you have backup documentation that can support that. So I believe that that's actually looking for um, your, your actual headcount. And then um, this will be the last one since we're getting close to the end here. But it, what about lease modifications? You talked about having to have the agreements in place by the February date. But what if you have a modification in the midst of that as part of a normal um, lease? Can, do you have to go with the amount that was in place in February or can you take the modified increase? I believe you can take the modified increase. This, the ruling specifically states that you just have an agreement in place prior to February 15th. So it couldn't be a brand new lease agreement or a brand new utility service. Um, as long as you had that agreement in place before and there was just a modification to it, that modification should be an eligible cost. Terrific, thank you. Thanks, Lottie. All right, well, I think that's all we have for our webinar today. Uh, thank you for joining us so much. Any questions that we did not get to during our presentation, we will follow up with you um, via email afterwards. Mel, do you have any last comments for today? I don't think so. Um, you know, I think forgiveness is the name of the game now, but expect to continue to see changes as we have been. Um, you can reach out to us here at Wegner um, to help you through the process, or if you're working with an accountant, check with them um, to make sure uh, if they have any advice or can help you through the process, especially if you have to file that standard form. Um, it's still a doozy, uh, so there's quite a bit involved, um, but just make sure that you're reaching out to resources um, for assistance and uh, you know, we'll, we'll help you through it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so just keep an eye out for the recording uh, from today's webinar. And again, the contact information is on the screen. So reach out to us if you have any other questions. Thank you all so much again for joining us. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Melody. Thanks.